So what Ariel asked me to do is try and talk a little bit about forecast philosophy, decision making. How many of you have been involved in storm chasing? So if you're involved in that, what's your process? Uh, maybe you call up the SPC Outlook for starters. Um, maybe you don't. But somewhere along the way, you've got to make some decisions based on a forecast of where am I going to head to? Where's the, what's the timing going to be? You're going through some type of forecast decision making. And hopefully, it will get you in the right place at the right time so that you can see what you were looking to see. Um, it's not a whole lot different compared to what we're doing upstairs in that we have to go through a process and we have to make decisions and we have to make decisions by a certain time even if we feel like we don't have enough information or that there's mixed signals or there's uncertainty in terms of what's going You still have to make a decision because if you wait until the event happens well, you've got the answer, but you're probably not also where you wanted to be. So you, you wind up going through a process. We go through a process as well. But I think in some ways, um, in many ways, it has changed dramatically over the decades in terms of how we go about forecasting. I, you don't have to use your imagination a whole lot to, to recognize that I've been around for a long time doing some of this. You know, I can't leave because they've said you can't leave till you get it right and I'm still waiting to get there. But um, we had far fewer information a long time ago when I started. Um, the SPC outlooks for severe weather go out to day eight now, right? When I started, how many days did we issue severe weather forecast for? Take a guess. Zero? That's close. <laughs> One. One. Because we didn't have much more than the basic observational information you've been looking at, upper air data, RAOBS, surface data. That's basically what was available back when severe weather forecasting began in the 50s. Um, and the forecast was for the current day. If you look at the SPC products now, the emphasis is still on the first day. We issue many more outlooks, mesoscale discussions, watches. If you look at the products that we issue, probably 75% of them are focused on day one. So we still have our roots in the here and now almost. And, but what has changed to allow us to try and issue, well, to issue forecasts that go out many days now for severe weather? What's the first thing that comes to mind in terms of what has changed over and above having observational data? Numerical weather prediction. Hmm? Numerical weather prediction. Numerical weather prediction. And that's right. Well, that started in the 50s also, just like severe weather forecasting in the old Weather Bureau. The numerical models have gotten much better and go farther and farther out in time. Initially, some of the models ran, you ready for this? A whole grand 24 hours. You had a 24 hour forecast. Um, and that was it. So we, we had more limited data. We concentrated on what we could, which was observational data. And we got satellite data in the 70s, 1970s. Um, and that was helpful, although it was much cruder than what we, we have now, obviously. But we didn't have as much data. And even when we had model data, it was a few facsimile charts of a few fields, relatively small number of fields. You didn't have that much to look at. So you had to make decisions with quite a bit of limitations to it. But Really, moving to the NWP, numerical weather prediction, has allowed us to spread out into the future, and it gives us a lot more to look at. We've, we've reached the point. In the old days, we used to complain, 
Well, of course I can't do any better. I hardly have any data to work with. Now people say, well, I've got more data than I can handle in the short period of time that I have to make a forecast. So one of the things that has changed is how do we manage the data that we are getting in? How many, what are we getting? We're getting tons of satellite, tons of radar, tons of numerical model output. How many models do you look at if you're making a forecast? How many models do you have access to? Count them up. You, you run out of one hand, right? You can, go to, you can go to two hands worth at least. How are you going to, you know, how do you manage all of that information, especially when the models may not agree on a particular solution? So you have a, a data management challenge. You have a challenge of extracting relevant information from the models, and that may vary from day to day of what's most important. So instead of saying, poor me, I don't have much data to work with, now it's, gee, if I look at everything I could possibly look at, the near-term weather event will have come and gone, and I'm still looking at data, and I haven't made my forecast. So that doesn't work particularly well. So this has become what Fred Carr has said. Fred has, used to say, well, we've got a higher hose of data, and how do we deal with it? Because it's going to blow us away. Well, I think some people say we've gone from a fire hose to a water cannon, and we have this continuous blast of data coming in. How do we extract the relevant information from it? And this is a big big challenge that the meteorological community has not addressed particularly well. This is something that maybe we don't talk about a lot, but it really does co come down to um, data mining, information extraction, and delivering it to a forecaster in a usable form in enough time so that you can assess it and move ahead with the forecast process. So a big challenge. So how many models do we have? Let's see, we've got the NAM, the GFS, the ECMWF, the Met Office, the Canadian Global. That's five. We can then go down to the RAP, the HER, the two high-res windows, the NAM Nest, the NISL Wharf, the Experimental NISL Ensemble, the NCAR Ensemble. I'm running out of fingers at this particular point. So why are we developing all these models as a community? To confuse us? To, try to make our lives more difficult? Or to try and come up with better approaches to modeling? So why do we have all the differences? Has anybody thought about it? What's a numerical model? It's, it's we take the Atmospheric equations, integrate them ahead in time, and we can come up with solutions. But what are some of the challenges? Well, how do you put together a model? A model is composed of a lot of components, if we even ex just exclude the data assimilation, in terms of physics packages, dynamic core, there's many options out there. You have many choices to make if you're going to put together a model. And in some situations, those choices are good. In other situations, maybe it doesn't give you the best answer. But if you're going to be a forecaster, and in particular, you're going to be a severe weather forecaster, somehow you have to make some decisions on how am I going to deal with all of this information. And that's just the modeling part of it. Am I going to choose models I'm comfortable with? Am I going to try and look at everything and figure out why they're different and what may be the most likely outcome? You have a lot of different ways you could deal with it, but you also know that you have a time deadline coming up and you're going to have to optimize your approach to, to, to forecasting. Um, so it's a lot of interesting challenges that 
again, as a community, we have proliferated potential information, but how we manage it has not necessarily been addressed as a community-wide enterprise. Because everybody wants to believe, I've got the best model. So, so we, we, have to, we have to budget our time, and we have to figure out what types of data are we going to be using. I think you have a good, you can answer this question. What types of data are we going to be using if we're making a day four to eight outlook versus what types of data are we going to be using if we're issuing a mesoscale discussion that covers the next three hours? If you think of it in terms of observational data, very simple classes, observational data, numerical weather prediction data. What are you going to use for a day four to eight product? What about if you're doing a, a short-term forecast? Will models play a role? Maybe in some respects. Maybe in some respects. Yeah. Models have become higher resolution in time and space. And with models such as the HER that have a somewhat of a dynamic hot start to them so it can approximate convective storms right at the start. They may be able to give you information in the very short time ranges. Um, although, as I, I indicated a couple of lectures ago, the skill drops off pretty quickly in the first few hours of the HER, the high resolution rapid refresh um, forecast. So models have served us in the outer time periods, we, we have to rely upon those. That's enabled us to extend our forecasting beyond the day one period in severe weather. But they've also could be considered to have encroached into the very short time scales as well. So we have to manage how we're going to incorporate um, that new data. And that's, that's an important part of recognizing, I think, observational data strengths and limitations, as well as model strengths and limitations, and how we blend them, especially in the, this mid-range of zero to six to nine hours or so, which is where we focus most of our attention for severe weather forecasting. That's where our watches, our MDs, and short-term outlooks are. I think, I think the biggest challenge that we have, and I, I mentioned this a, a couple of classes ago, I think, is that we could take a shortcut and we could just take model data, get the gridded data, and whatever the model says, I'm going to use that for my forecast. Because obviously it knows more than I do about integrating the equations of motion. But yet we know that it isn't always going to give us the right answer. Why? What are some of the challenges? Those of you who've, who've had, uh, and how many of you have had an NWP class? You have way up in the back, I know that. <laughs> but that's Professor Cavallo. Um, if you think about forecasting, what I mentioned early on is a forecast is you start with an analysis and then you apply a trend. And that's what models do. So you start with the analysis. Well, do we have a perfect handle on the state of the atmosphere? We don't, especially above the ground. We have a lot more dense observing network near the ground. We have information above the ground from aircraft, some satellite data, although again, the vertical resolution of the satellites, at least the geostationary satellites, is, is relatively coarse. The RAOBs are relatively few and far between, so we have a lot of gaps. So we're not starting out with a perfect analysis. That's what's referred to as initial condition uncertainty. We don't have all the details that we would like, but we still have to make a first guess. What's the background look like? But then when it comes to the model, we also don't have perfect models. We don't represent the physical processes as well as we need to. So even if we had a perfect start to the state of the atmosphere, 
The models aren't perfect, so there's going to be errors that creep in as the model integrates. What if we had a perfect model, but we don't have perfect initial conditions? So we have two primary sources of errors. And those errors are going to create uncertainty in the forecast. There's been a lot of discussion. I think everyone is aware to some extent of the uh, need to move toward probabilistic forecasting and to provide some measure of confidence or uncertainty to the user community, the customers, that they want to know, well, how likely do you think this forecast is going to turn out right? What's your confidence level in it? Um, it's somewhat ironic, I think, that if you think about weather, the weather either happens or it doesn't. It's deterministic. But by the very nature of the uncertainties and the model imperfections, it's very difficult for us to have confidence in a perfectly deterministic forecast. Because of the uncertainty, there is an element of probability involved. We have to try and represent that uncertainty. And how we go about doing that is a continuing challenge. We issue probabilistic forecasts from SPC. Our outlook categories are tied to probabilities of events. In our watches, we give some probabilities of uh, certain event categories. In our mesoscale discussions, we give a probability of a watch coming. We're trying to account for some of the uncertainty or the likelihood of what may happen because we're recognizing that we have to deal with this uncertainty. Um, there's really no way around it. Although, there's various ways to try and deal with it. Um, I've heard some forecasters say the role of the forecaster is to reduce or eliminate uncertainty and predict what's going to happen. That's what you're getting paid for. I've heard other forecasters say, well, no, the science tells us that there is uncertainty. We can't wish it away. And our job is to somehow incorporate and account for the uncertainty in our decision-making process. And if there is too much uncertainty, there could be a number of different solutions. You look at a whole bunch of different model forecasts and they might give you some different solutions two, two days from now. Or you look at an ensemble forecast system. How many of you know what an ensemble system is? Almost everybody, where you have a number of model runs that may be different in some controlled ways. They all start out at the same time and then you run them out and you see what the spread is in the different solutions and that hopefully gives you a measure of uncertainty. You can compute probabilities from it. Some folks say, well, if, if I have a large spread in the solutions, that tells me maybe I shouldn't be confident in any one particular solution. And I have to recognize that there's more uncertainty on this particular day, and I have to somehow convey that information. This is, this is one of these challenging things in terms of how do we account for uncertainty in the forecast process. Um, and it especially becomes interesting when we talk about severe weather forecasting. Um, what occurs more often in Norman? Actually, this is a bad example. Um, a tornado or rain? As little rain as we've had the last five months, but... Um, Obviously, rain occurs in a climatological sense more frequently than, say, a tornado does in any one location, even in central Oklahoma, which during a certain time of the year has a higher climatological uh, frequency of tornadoes. So when we're talking about severe weather forecasting, we're talking about what could be considered rare events from a climatological perspective, climatological probabilities are very low compared to probabilities of precipitation occurring. So there's even more uncertainty when we talk about rare event forecasting and how are we going to incorporate that. That is, because more often than not, you can make a forecast 
in central Oklahoma without looking at anything and say, well, I don't think there'll be a tornado today. What are the odds you're going to be correct? On many days, you'll be correct. But if it's May 20th of 2013 and you're in more, that forecast isn't going to be very good. Um, so how do we deal with this uncertainty, which is higher with severe weather forecasting? These are challenges that we have to deal with in this case. So when we, we're talking about severe weather, there's some, it's, there's some uncertainty. We're not going to be right all the time. There's not going to be a severe storm at every square mile within, say, an outlook area. But yet, we know in, 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 from an area perspective, there's going to be false alarms. So we have to balance the idea of false alarms and um, the, 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 the ability to actually predict the event. But there's, there's different penalty functions. If you issue a forecast, if you issue a warning, let's get it down to warning scale, that's easier. If you issue a warning and you issue a tornado warning and there's not a tornado within the tornado warning, so it's considered a false alarm. What's the user response to that? How might they react? Take a, what do you think? They're going to accept it. They're going to be unhappy. Maybe it depends on what they did. If they took shelter and didn't, then they came out and said, I didn't need to. They may not believe the next one actually is. So maybe there's a bit of a cry wolf sense Although some studies suggest people are somewhat forgiving of false alarms, especially if something occurred nearby. Okay, what if a tornado occurs and you didn't have a warning out? So it was a failure to predict or detect. How's the response going to be? Ah, so the penalty function is different between a failure to predict and a false alarm. So how do you weigh that into your forecasting? Are you willing to include more forecasts if you think there's a chance something might happen? Where on the scale of chance is it? How do you determine that? Are you up on the upper end of the scale, the middle part, the lower end? You have to consider these different things in the forecast and warning process for severe weather because it can have, it can have a high, high impact. Um, I think one of the things that we have to also consider is that if you go into weather forecasting, no matter how smart you are, with the exception of Ariel, you're going to be wrong on some days. It just goes with the territory. Um, this is something that we have to deal with as forecasters. Um, think of a baseball player. How many of you have any knowledge of baseball? How many of you know anything about batting averages? Quantitative. You're considered a good hitter if you're, quote, successful three out of ten times. How successful is considered success in forecasting severe weather? If we're right three out of ten times, so it's hard to know on that. But what it comes down to is we're going to not be as correct as we want to be. I don't know if Rich has told you the story of his first severe weather forecast, his first solo outlook. Yeah, the Lahoma Day. Sometimes it's good to get that out of your system fast. Um, we've all had situations where things have not turned out the way we thought they should. Again, we're talking about rare event forecasting, so most of the time things aren't going to happen. But for, for all of us, we've had situations where things did not work out. And you have to find a way of dealing with that. 
Um, I was on the evening shift, November 28th, 1988. It sticks in my mind. Around midnight, there was a tornado that went through Raleigh. Four people were killed. Cells didn't have an outlook out. We didn't have a watch out. We didn't help those people. They were in bed sleeping. And occurred in the middle, you know, at night. Um, it was a challenging situation for a variety of reasons. Um, but we didn't cover it well. These things happen to just about everybody. If you do it, the only person who has a perfect forecast record is someone who's issued hardly any forecasts. Um, no matter how hard you work at it, you're dealing with many days that seem like things are on the fence. There's a possibility something could happen. It's nowhere near a slam dunk, but you have to deal with it. And this is something that I think severe weather forecasters in particular have to find ways of what I've always counseled people in, coping with failure. We, we have a tendency to attract people who want have, who have perfectionist tendencies, and they work extremely hard at what they do, but they're still missing information about what's going on in the atmosphere. And we have to deal with these sort of things. So how do you deal with this if you want to go into forecasting? One of the recommendations I would make is you're going to continue to study and learn for as long as you can, as long as you're breathing as a forecaster. You're going to study. You're going to do research, applied research to help. You're going to study some more. And you're going to continue to follow that path because we can't know enough. We all have to continue to try and push the envelope ahead. You see the work that Ariel does, the work that Rich does, does, do, whatever. Um, been in this a long time, but we still don't know enough. So these are things that you have to really devote yourself to if you want to go into this area. It's not easy. It's the most challenging forecasting job I think there is, that we really get excited about it. But you have to be prepared that it's not going to be as good as you'd like on some days. And you have to keep working ahead. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, this is fascinating work. Um, I hope some of you might get interested in it, because we need sharp people to go into it and to, to help the science and to help the operational aspects.